Nope, we are good to go. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another author sit down. Last time we did this, I had just two with Brandon Sanderson and Joe Abercrombie. This time I've decided to try and even more enhance the casual conversation by bringing in three uh, fascinating different, uh, let's call them heads of the genres, because we all have pretty different niches here. Uh, we are joined by William White, or Will Wick, as I call you on my channel for literally no reason, uh, who is best known for, I'd say, the Cradle series, correct? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, and then we have Travis Baldry, the, I would say, king of comfy cozy, uh, has had incredible success with Legends and Lattes and just released... I love that title. Yeah. <laughs> Bookshops and Bone Dust, and Bryce is here, too. So, uh, I figured... <laughs> and then, of Bryce course, we Ward have... Here. And Rob. <laughs> we also have Bryce O'Connor, who just released a book that has been doing so well uh and i want to say are you still on top in charts or is it calming down a little bit it's calming down a little bit i've got i I've, I've it's it's still doing very well but uh but it's definitely calmed down a little bit Good. I, I can't complain though. now is the time you, of the you beat the number three on uh, the kindle store right yeah dude you don't have to remind me i i, yeah. I get, like i I still have like convulsions thinking about it. Like I got that blue tag. I was like, what is this? I think I, I, think I might have yeah. messaged Rebecca. I think I was like, I don't know what this is. But I'll take it. Yeah. Well, the format of this already seems to be uh, well known amongst these authors because you all hear from me pretty much every day. So now it's my time to shut up and occasionally ask questions and let a round table of uh, wonderful authors we all follow uh, answer questions either from you, the audience, or things I have prepared here. Uh, and I actually, with the three of you, had what I thought would be a kind of fun question uh, because we have people who are kind of more. Oh, Potato is telling me the guests are a bit quiet, and I do trust my mod name, Potato. There we go. Um, so we are going to start with a we question. Can just scream really loud. <laughs> Actually, ah! um, Bryce specifically, I think they're saying you're the quietest. So that I can't fix you being at different levels. So if you could just scream shout the entire interview, I think that would be great. Um, I think I can fix that. But uh, so the first question I wanted to ask, and I wanted to start this uh, with you, Travis, uh, and it's one I just. The full story from all three would be wonderful. What was your first day where you sat down to try and attempt your first book like? What did that decision look like? And how did that first writing session go for you? The first one ever? Yes. And I don't okay, care if it so was in middle school like, or when you were 30. Yeah, we're talking like like high school, the first attempt I had to write a novel. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody, a friend of mine had a printout of what I did write of this novel. So I read... A couple of books in the wheel of time in high school and i thought that was i knew what i was going to write a horrible pastiche of the wheel of time clearly <laughs> um and i think i started with the glossary which was probably 10 or 15 pages and then i started writing and i want to say i got like I, I made it about 80 or 90 pages into this really really terrible terrible fantasy novel and then i stopped as i did again and again every time i tried to write something until I got to my 40s. But a friend of mine saved it, saved a printout I'd done in the computer lab and handed it to me in a binder a few years ago. And I'm it is so easily sorry. the worst thing that anyone has ever handed to me. <laughs> yeah. It was just horrifying. Um, I felt pretty good about it at the time until I had to make a coherent story of any sort. And then it was really, really depressing. Yeah, I still have a, uh, a printed out binder of the first draft of House of Blades, and I don't even look at that, much less anything I wrote in high school. So I would be, I would be mortified to be handled, handed something like that. It's not I, okay. I think I don't now found that. myself a guys, job of something you guys to do. Only have one band. Just digging binder. through, yeah. <laughs> I had, I had, I had like a wall until recently. My parents just sold my childhood house, and they were like, "Do you want us to throw this out?" And it's like ten boxes of binders, and I'm like, "Yeah, no." <laughs> I want one of your early books. So this is something that I have wanted to do for a long time, which is to take well-known authors' early writing and do like a very professional narration of it. Oh, my like God. I want to take it's terrible. I hate. I, that. I, well, it doesn't have to be yours. I'm in. That's I'm knowingly, in. unless somebody else has one of Will's and wants to provide it, in which case we can do it without his consent. Don't but do that because my Bryce, my Bryce has a bunch. Mile at UCF. <laughs> 
<laughs> Bryce, you just have to pick the cream of the crop and send it my way. So, so I can do that, or I can text Will's sister and find out what kind of dirt we can. Uh, we That's can true. You guys have contact. That works. I can't stop that that works. Idea. Yeah. So my, what I remember, <laughs> yeah. my first time sitting down to write was very similar to Travis. I uh, also read The Wheel of Time in high school. Uh, I think I started in middle school and uh, then went through into high school. And I was like, great, that's the peak of all fiction. So I was right, at least I was ahead of my time. And I, uh, and so I started writing some, there were several novels I started in high school and into college that made it 20 or 30,000 words. And I just got to the point where I was like, you know what, I really need to start over and really need to know what I'm doing before I, before I begin writing. And then I would abandon it. So it wasn't until I was doing my uh, master's degree in creative writing and people kept asking me, what do you want to do with a master's degree in creative writing? I said, I want to write a novel. And they said, oh, so you've written a novel. And I said, no. And so my family was like, okay, you can't keep doing that. So you got to put your money where your mouth is and we will pay you uh, $2 per completed page to actually write a novel, put your money where your mouth is. So uh, I was like, okay, I, I mean, I'll, I'll do it for, for money for a few hundred bucks. Yeah, that sounds good. More than I'm probably ever going to make. And so I sat down and was like, look, the one thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to stop. I'm going to go from beginning to end. And I went into my big box of handwritten notes that Bryce mentioned. I definitely do have one of those and I still have it. And I went through and I found the idea that I thought I could actually complete. I could, I could get to the end of the novel. And that ended up being House of Blades, my first, my first book. So Yep. So that was the best, uh, you know, four hundred dollars they ever spent. Wow. <laughs> I so I I love that story because it, it highlights something that that I like really harp on, especially whenever someone's talking about like getting into writing and getting into publishing, um, which is that I had I had a kind of a similar but very very different like rollout of that. I, I did finish uh, I finished my first book in high school. I was like, I think I was. I think I was 17 when I finished it, and it was hot garbage. It was how long to, was it? To, you finished, like, it, you well, finished it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I finished it. It was it was um, it was about a hundred and probably 150,000 words. Um, Dang, dude! Wow, that was so so it, wow. It, it, well, thanks. It was all trash, but uh, but it, it actually gets better than that because um, uh, I it was it was hot garbage. You know, Travis, same thing. Where I I, I look at it now and I'm like, oh no, oh god. Um, but uh, <laughs> But after I, I was like three or four books into my first series, The Wings of War, I decided that I actually needed a, a, a change of pace. I just needed a break. And so I actually went back and I picked that book up and I mm. totally rewrote it. And that's what turned into A Mark of Kings, which was nice. the book that yeah. allowed me to start yeah, the, uh, the company. So it's just I, I, I love the different stories of like how people get started because like there's no you know, like there's no right way to get into this space. Right. Like. <laughs> There's no like one way to kind of like dive into this. I am just impressed with the fact that you were able to write a novel, yeah, a you full 150,000 word amazing. novel in high school yeah. and that you've repeatedly finished novels without, I, I, I don't know what kind of encouragement you had or if you had somebody you were writing for or if somebody was dangling anything else in front of you, but it doesn't sound like they were, which amazes me. It's so cool. Yeah, no, I have a friend I, who I just, uh, I have a friend who's my age, and he is uh, now doing NaNoWriMo for the first time this month. And he was talking about how, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, hey, man, if you get to the end of NaNoWriMo and you've hit your goal, you've done it. That's that's You hit the goal, man. So I, I was just encouraging him. It doesn't really matter what you have at the end. Uh, do it. So, yeah. Yeah. So I am hearing the inklings, the beginnings of what sounds like the greatest charity project ever, which is collecting authors shame binders of writings they never want to see the light of day, <laughs> and putting them together in some kind of compendium to put out there. Uh, and I feel like Travis would be willing to narrate that. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. With absolute 100 percent earnestness. I'm pretty sure I had a nightmare like that and it was narrated by Travis. <laughs> I think I think all my nightmares are narrated by Travis at this point. And, and, and I, I think that is because my brain is trying to comfort me and not because Travis's voice is part of my nightmare. But that um, makes sense. Yeah, Daniel, I like that you're like, that's a charity project because I, I prefer that idea to mine, which for the longest time I have been like, because of Kindle Unlimited, I've been like, you know what? I'm going to take the old version, the, the, the version 0.0 .0 of these books that are finished. I'm going to tack them onto the end of the book as free content. And then I'm just going to release them 
for the same price so that people basically get twice the book but like it's it's monetizing it which is not nearly as cool an idea as as a charity project which i'm much more on board for <laughs> but they get ambushed at the end with old content they're just like it's just i was here for the first half and then you you have to take the second half <laughs> required yeah, you got you got no choice at this point That's you, right, might yeah, well, you might as well just keep going that it's, actually is a brilliant transition into a question I had from a fan here uh, that I think is going to be tailored towards you, Bryce, but then everyone, because as was pointed out earlier, we have three different, very different entries into being a fantasy author here, uh, which is kind of becoming more and more common. It seems like every new success story that comes out in fantasy, there's just from a different background, from a different approach to trying to break into the industry. It seems like right now, it's never been a more chaotic, more difficult, and yet exciting time to be a fantasy author. Is there anything in your books that you feel like wouldn't have found the success that it did if you had had to go back to like the 1950s and try and do the trad, you know, route that way that you were able to find with uh, success with now? Uh, so, I mean, like heading back to the 1950s, for some reason, my, uh, my answer goes straight to straight to a, a certain specific thing um, that I don't know if this is the answer that you're looking for, but uh, uh, if you look at my one star reviews, uh, about 75% of my one star reviews start with uh, with uh, politics injected into <laughs> into fantasy or 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 woke propaganda disguised as an action. Uh, Basically, basically, you put the existence of any character that isn't that isn't like 100% straight or 100% like what the expectation of like my traditional like like ah oh, masculine hero gets the girl kind of thing and like. It, so if you go back to the 50s, you're a commie sympathizer. Is that what that is? is that what your yeah. one star reviews are in the 50s? Yeah, yeah, that's that's, okay. that's right. I, <laughs> like we're, we're like total red scare there. Like mm -hmm. I, I I would be canceled if that was the thing in the 50s. Man, even go back into the 90s, read any fantasy fiction from the 90s, and it's kind of just, it's really startling. The perspectives that tend to prevail are super startling. Um, yeah, speaking of the Wheel of Time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew there was no it politics kind of, in any fiction before hope. 2015. No, clearly not. There clearly were no not. politics before 2015. I don't think they existed. There, yeah, absolutely right. not. But it, it also it also gives me hope, and like I don't want to turn this stream into into a, a political thing at all. But like if we even if we're just sticking to fantasy, it gives me hope that like we look at that and it's a stark like oh I was like alive in this time, but also I was alive in that time, which means in the in the last twenty years, like fantasy and fiction and, and a lot of aspects have evolved very quickly, which to me is not a bad thing. Yeah, one of the things uh, that I tend to talk about a lot, or at least with uh, my friends and family, is I, I don't. I got I published my first book in 2013 and Kindle Direct Publishing was only around for a year or two before that so it was really only getting big around 2012 2013 and I dude if I had had this book a few years before what was I going to do with it I would have had to keep working on it until it got accepted by a traditional publisher and that was indeed what they teach you to do in the school in school right so they teach you to uh, approach traditional publishers and so what I wanted to do is because this KDP thing was was growing I wanted to see if I could write a book that didn't have a middleman because I wanted to see if the readers would appreciate the kind of stories I was writing and more looking for the same things I was. And so I wanted to see if people would respond directly because I didn't have to go through a middleman. Well, I intended to leverage that into a traditional publishing deal later on, but of course I didn't have to. Whereas in Elm, any other, any time before 2011, I would have definitely had to. There would have been no other alternative for me. I'm not going to print my own books in my garage. So that's what I would have had to do. So it may, my publishing career, writing career may have looked very different. Yeah, I don't think that, um, I never would have attempted traditional publishing. Um, I don't think. I certainly didn't plan to attempt it this time out. And, uh, just the existence of the current publishing landscape is the only reason I bothered. Hmm. But even if I had gone traditional publishing and it had been my desire, I still don't think I would have gotten it published because I think, um, for one, I think Legends and Lattes is very much a product of a specific time period that was that had popularity because of a specific time period. Everybody's been in COVID for years. They're exhausted. They don't want any red weddings at all. They just want to see somebody's human face. So the desire for a book that was comforting, that also 
happen to intersect with a lot of other interests happening at the same time. You know, people are playing D&D on Discord. Critical Role is a big thing. Arcane comes out on Netflix. All of these things combine to have a perfect time where legends and lattes can succeed. For it to have gone through traditional publishing, there would have been no way for those, those, uh, those moments to intersect because they don't work on that sort of time scale. So it wouldn't have made sense for them to pick it up at all. And trying to make the case that that was actually going to be the state of the world two years from now when it finally came out would have been an impossible case to make. So the only way it could have existed and succeeded, I think, is because of the fact that I could write, edit, and publish the thing in three months flat. Um, and when are you going to do that in any other model? Of, as somebody outside of Travis Baldry's head, counterpoint, I read a beta version of Legends and Lattes, and I was about half a page in, and I went, this is good. So I was immediately like, "This not only is it written well, not only has he learned a lot of lessons from the books he's <laughs> from <read>. you, <laughs> yeah, well, from from a lot of people. Uh, so not only has he learned a lot of lessons from the books he's read, he he and applied them to his writing. I was going, this is something that I knew it had a target audience. I knew there were people out there who wanted to read this cozy fantasy, and that's been a uh, genre in other cultures for years, where they have this this." fiction that's made to just feel good be feel good fiction right and it's underserved in fantasy and so then so it was i was reading it going like this is definitely going to hit with this crowd and uh and it did more foresight I'm, than i had so <laughs> i i want to i want to jump right off of right off of will there because i i do i do want to talk about the the value of, of traditional publishing and self-publishing and how i also i also would not attempt traditional publishing maybe now i, I recently had conversations with with uh, with Travis and then also Christopher Paolini, which have changed my my concept of it a little bit. But first of all, when it comes to Legends and Lattes, here's here's the thing about Legends and Lattes. Like having having read it, it's it, and and having like thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, like those things that you were talking about, like the the state of the world and all these things, like definitely had a positive impact on it. But all they did is they optimized they optimized the level of success that the book was going to have because of uh, because of certain situations. But the reality is like. Like come luck comes to those who are prepared or those willing to get up and, and get shit done. And and what you kind of did is I think that you you built your own luck. I think you 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 basically created something so good and and so enjoyable that it was always going to hit a market. It was always going to be re be received in a positive light because it is just a successful, good, enjoyable uh, story. But those things that you were talking about are only the things that optimized. They're not the things so, that made it successful. I appreciate all the ego stroking, stroking from both of you. It's really fabulous. But right. as a narrator, one of the things I notice and one of the reasons I believe this is because I read a lot of books that I think are exceptionally well written and have a specific audience and timing or circumstance just don't let them reach them. And I'm like a little nonplussed whenever it happens. I'm like, oh my God, this book is incredible. It's so well written. This gives me all the things I want, and I know there are people that I know who want this, but is the time just wrong? Is the presentation just wrong? Is, is it just, how, why is this not finding its audience? So it seems clear to me that there's all kinds of obstacles of circumstance that get in a way of a lot of books that otherwise would be successful. And I, I just, mostly because I see it happen so frequently. Um, so, go finish, Travis. Anyway, I don't need to ramble on about it. Um, no, I, but and I like it, so so this this jumps in a little bit to, to what you were talking about like uh, like um, we were talking about traditional publishing versus versus self publishing and that's one of the things that I love about self publishing personally is you're talking about the timing you're talking about these other elements that um, that come into uh, that come into play and and there's so many advantages and disadvantages to each of the spaces but one of the things that that self publishing does allow you to do is I think have a little bit more control over some of those elements and a little bit more control over over the 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 luck involved like there's always going to be luck it's what you're talking about there like yeah. there's so many things that that have to line up in order for a book to really get the to really get the traction to become something really impressive and really astounding and with self-publishing it it it, it you have a little bit more control over that rudder. You have a little bit more control over the timing of when something goes out, where it goes out, how it goes out, all this stuff. But I, I, I maintain, and I, and 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 I, I really, I really don't think that this is ego stroking. I, like I maintain that 
that you make your own luck. And I and and I I include you in this because again, yeah. Legends and Lattes is is an incredible incredible success. But I think more broadly that you were just the 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 highlight of uh, that you were just uh, the, the highlight of the group of individuals who. Um, who create an incredible product and then because you have created the the car and because you have created the engine the moment for it to get going did come along but if you hadn't built it in the first place it never would have gone yeah well it can one be of the both things ego stroking I, and honest <laughs> well, one of the things i think that you things and i'm usually exclusive one of the things I think you touched on um, as far as making your own luck is that you can do as an indie publisher that is one of its huge advantages is that if you go into it with a foreknowledge that basically it is a gamble to a certain extent, you're rolling the dice, you get to roll the dice a lot faster and a lot more often as a self-publisher. Because if you want to go through the traditional publishing process, you're going to go through you know your agent process, your submissions, and then the eventual production processes, which is going to be a year plus. But as a self-pub, you can rattle out four books in a year. You can rattle out more. I know people do. Can you? Um, <laughs> I can. <laughs> well, some people, some people clearly do. I, I'm just That's saying true. that the, the pace, the pace of release is massively accelerated, which means that you can stop and evaluate and say, this worked or it didn't work. And here's why I think that is. And you can adjust and you can try again and you can sure. do this incredibly rapidly in a way that's not possible. And if you, if you, if you put out a book that doesn't work, it doesn't carry the same weight, I think, that it does in TradPub. If you release a book through TradPub channels and it sinks like a stone, that is carried with you in your future TradPub career in a way that I don't think it is in SelfPub. Yeah, and a more, I mean, in a very direct way, uh, there was a few years ago when I was, uh, we were doing a, it was one of the, one of the Cradle books, I think, and we were sending out an NDA to the um, beta readers for the first time and they were getting in one of the one of my beta readers is a lawyer and he went I, I and i said so is this like an, an nda is this okay for and he's like look i would have told you to do this years ago except that you release two books a year so most authors if they lose something some income to their uh, to their big book they're losing a year or two of income with you it's half a year of income so it's not that big not a bit not as big of a deal and that made me uh, that just kind of kept it at my awareness i kept i was like oh right each individual book is less it's less important to uh my well-being it, whether it succeeds or not whereas sometimes you really have got to hit a home run or you're not going to be able to continue yeah. writing professionally right so well then there's the other uh, knock-on effect where you're writing more books which means you're getting better as a writer faster let's hope you're compounding what you learn and what you apply really really quickly uh, this actually really uh, nicely transitions into another question I had here. Uh, this is actually just for me because I find myself oh. in a similar situation. Uh, I think I know I can say for certainty with Bryce, uh, he loves what he does, but he struggles with work-life balance as I do because when you love what you do, you can kind of always do it. And it's something that just kind of can become, oh my gosh. And Travis, I've seen you just be a prolific narrator and now you're an author. You managed to get a sequel out not long after your uh, uh, Legends and Lattes and Will, you're sitting in front of a mantle of your uh, hustle <laughs> and you have Kickstarter after Kickstarter going right now. How has, do you feel like it's a work-life balance issue or are you just doing what you love every day? How does that feel for you? Let's start with Will, if you don't mind, like what is your, does it feel like a hustle or does it feel like you're just enjoying what you're doing? You know, I, yeah, I hear people say a lot, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I have no clue what that's like. Um, I feel like those people may be delusional. Uh, so to me, it's, it's, I'm going, I do love what I do, but it's hard. It's work. It's very, it's, it's, there's a lot of days where you don't feel like writing. There was, uh, I mean, I was writing today and I was just every, every thousand words felt like I was peeling it out of my bones. It was terrible. I was like, I just have to get, I just have to get a scene down on paper so that I can make it good later because what I'm writing now is terrible. So it feels very hard. And so one of the things that I have talked about a lot is designing the environment in both terms of time and place and people around you so that you can do the things to you really want to do. And by that, I mean, right. So I'm not gonna, left alone to my own devices. I am not going to write, even though what I really want to do is get a book done, right? But in the moment, I don't feel that. 
So what I do instead is I lock myself in a cabin or very frequently being down here on the coast of Florida, a cruise ship, and I have nothing to do but write. So I sit there and I go, so for a, I usually do it in blocks of time, so I usually do a week or two at a time, but I started off doing it a day or two at a time. And I would just lock myself there and go, there's nothing else I'm doing. Everybody knows I'm doing this. My phone's off and I am just writing. And I do that because left to my own devices, I would find something else to do. Travis, yeah. you have a look on your face there. That made, is it disagreement? Is it agreement? No, no, no. Well, it's, it's, um, it's partial agreement. It always feels like work. Writing feels like work, work. Yeah. What, writing is way harder than narrating by the way. Um, and I, for me, it's like laying bricks. I've just got to go in and lay the bricks. And I'm really, the, mo the, the thing I like most about writing is being done. Yes. Like the moment oh, yeah. after it's finished, I'm like, oh, I finished. This is yeah. great. Yeah. This is fabulous. The actual writing, I don't get a lot. I'll have moments of joy. Like something mm -hmm. works great or I make a discovery while I'm writing that surprises me yeah. um, in a way that I enjoy. I think that's really nice, but it's very brief. And most of it is surrounded by work. I overall work too much, period. I've always been too much of a workaholic and I've always overcommitted to things. So I always, I'm always very optimistic about how much I can do and will kill myself to try and do it. Um, which is not, I have a terrible work-life balance and I had, I made efforts when I was just narrating to make that better. Um, and for a while it worked and then COVID happened and I never left the house and I got used to scheduling with the idea that I would never do anything else because I never did anything else because there wasn't anything else to do. And then that just kept perpetuating past COVID when the world opened up again. And then I wrote a book and I had writing obligations at the same time and it just got worse. And so you I have been suffering from success. Just uh. <laughs> I've spent the last year trying to dig myself out of this hole with limited success. So I'm really terrible at the balance of it and it's not because I'm transcendent with joy at the moment to moment work of it. Um, but now I sound like I'm complaining. I'm, I'm very fortunate and I feel like I'm in a great position, but I definitely have a lot of personal challenges making my life livable. Well, one of the things I think it's important to talk about that is people tend to uh, overemphasize the importance of inspiration in the writing process. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I knew that was. Yeah, so it's the people just, they think you're, I don't know, channeling this from heaven or whatever, I don't know. And it's like, look, that's fun when you get that feeling every once in a while, but for the most part, 99% of it is you're just sitting down and you need a scene written, so you go write a scene. You just show up to your job yeah. and, you do, and you do your job. So that's why I think it's just important to continue. It's I, I also don't like bringing up the negatives of it because I really love writing. I love the, yeah. I, I love the book, I love interacting with the fans, I love the whole thing. I just like making up stories, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> but, it's it really is people tend to think once i'm inspired with the right story then i'll go write it and i'm like dude the way to get to inspiration is through perspiration do you guys um i, I believe it's an f scott fitzgerald's quote um that states uh if uh, if i waited for inspiration to strike i would never write another word in my life yeah yeah um so it, it I very much feel that that exact same way. For me, it, it comes and goes in in bouts. There's also Stephen King said the only thing that you need to be a writer is the burning desire to write, and I had that for a long time. I had that when I was writing that book in high school. I would wake up at literally two a.m. and I had this scene that I had to get down or I could not sleep. Wow. Um, and uh, I experienced that again um, a little bit when I was writing Iron Prince, and again a little bit when I was writing Fire and Song. But they they were awesome. very. They were very uh, limited, you know. Those those weren't those weren't often. Most of the time, it was like you said, peeling it, peeling it off the bones, and, and very much following again the mantra of, "Don't get it right, get it written," because you can always get it right later. Um, uh, not to mention, kind of side note, it's been fascinating the last two because uh, I, I put my roughs out on Patreon, and then I also public release them uh, with like a delay. The last two chapters that I've put out, I've put out a version two on Patreon because I was like, I didn't like these I, and I put out the version two and it was really cool seeing the response of like the, oh, like this is so much better. Or, oh, I didn't like this. And it just, the, the entire process of putting it out there, the response that, that I've gotten from doing that is, is really, really, uh, really interesting. But um, that's uh, actually it's, very, it's really, look, that's very interesting. I want to know more from you on that. So I'm, we're going to need to call, like talk on the phone after this because I'm very interested sure. in the difference between your rough 
version in your final round. I'm I speak interested. on behalf of the audience here, now, here. Yeah, that's it, that's it, man. It's your turn. I'm very curious. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it because apparently the way that I do it is 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 a little strange. But um, but uh, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. But uh, oh, sorry. the no, you're you're totally good. Me losing my train of thought. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I have been I am fidgeting and basically like doing the entire ADHD rock right now because you guys are. It's so interesting, and I'm just like sitting here like. <laughs> um, but. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it's really, really cool. Like hearing about hearing about y'all's work-life balance and hearing about your own systems, because it actually makes me feel a lot better about um, my own stuff. I uh, I do what? <laughs> um, I have an extremely unhealthy work work-life balance. It's not even. It's not even bad. It's 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 just unhealthy. Um, it, there's a and and I do it knowingly. Like I'm, I'm trying to write full time while also trying to do Wraithmark full time while also trying to run a miniatures business full time, and it, it doesn't work. It really doesn't. And I have managed it to a certain extent, but uh, it has gotten to the point now that it's it is just unhealthy. And and moving away from that and realizing that and that hole and like knowing when there's a knowing where where you are and knowing that it's time to kind of make a change like life isn't about being perfect and life isn't and being a creator isn't about getting it right it's about like identifying like okay like this isn't ideal this isn't working it's time to make it's time to make a change which i think you know travis you touched on it is a really important yeah. part of of work-life balance is identifying when it needs to be you have to ask lots, lots of uncomfortable questions of yourself because I think a lot of it, you start with the, the idea that you understand that time is finite and you want to wring as much out of it as you can. That like it's passing, this moment is passing. If I don't cram everything I can into it, then I'm like selling myself short. Um, but at the same time, then you have to ask the question, well, the, the other important quality of my time is the quality of my time is like, how, how is this spent? What do I get out of this as a person? How do I feel based on how I've spent this time? And then when you think about those things, you have to think about which one do I actually value and why? And that's an even more uncomfortable question. And then you just ignore it and go back because you have so many things to do until you have a, you know, you have some idle moment later or you're on a, you're on a, uh, you're on a chat with a bunch of other authors and then you think about it and then you're also uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, look, the, in terms of the balance aspect of this, I, it, it like you said earlier, it's very easy to have uh, because you can write any time, right? So it feels like you can always sit down and write. You can always make progress on your writing. You can always interact with fans. So it's something that just like never fully goes away. And because of that, I've over the years had to really implement a lot of barriers in my life to stop me from doing these things. So uh, over time, like for instance, uh, I've brought other people on to help me with my social media. I've, uh, I have people who we have to think, we have to plan out my schedule in advance so that I'll spend the right amount of time on writing, but I'll also spend the right amount of time off. Uh, it really is, uh, we've got to really, and so we've got to like ironclad, I've got to stick to my days off because otherwise I don't take any time off. And so it's, there's just been, there were a number of times I took a, um, 2021 was the first time I had taken any a, a big chunk of time off. So I took a sabbatical for three months. I didn't write, didn't work on, didn't work for three months. And that was uh, eight years into my writing career. And it took that long to put the right like systems and balances and processes into place so that I could take that time off. So it took a long time to build that up, build the right team, build the right schedule, build the right, and then go into it the right way. And what I expected was that was really gonna dig me out of the hole and revitalize me and I was feeling burned out, but I was gonna come back and writing was gonna be great. And I got right back into my next book and went, this is still really hard. But what I figured out over the next few months was I was way so deep in debt that that had, that had just gotten me back to, to even, that had, I hadn't built up any credit yet. So yep. that was, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. I and mean, you have to learn how to actually be able to take your time off. And I have not been able to learn. I haven't stacked up enough time. So when I have any time off now, I'm like the fish in the bags at the end of Finding Nemo. So like, now what? <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't literally don't know what to do with myself. And even starting something recreational feels futile because I know I'm going to go back yeah. to work soon. Like I can't, I don't have enough time to even commit to relaxing. 
Oh, so dude. instead, I'm going to waste it. And then I have a lot of self-recrimination because I'm wasting this time. I should have been relaxing or I should have been working. And now I did neither. That's even worse. Oh, look. I and, thought... I, yeah, that's, I have that exact experience. And the same thing with the work. I have to get people to make me do this stuff. So I need people's help. I have to get my friends and family. I have to tell them what I'm doing and have them go, make me do this. I am so jealous of your your these family firewalls that you have built up. They're yeah, so they're amazing. <laughs> they're, they're they're legit firewalls. Uh, I, I I can't remember if it was if it was uh, Daniel or me or it was one of us when we were setting this up. I think Sam. It might have been Sam or it was Rebecca uh, emailed us back and they were like, "That date doesn't work. It's one of Will's days off. Not allowed. Just like like." fucking mixed like and it was they do the same thing to me man they do the same thing to me i say yeah. i'm gonna do something and then they're going why didn't you check with us that's one of your days off i'm like i'm yeah. sorry i think i think that's when you know you have a good system in place though when it comes to your team because my team is the is the exact same way um well i took uh, i took 10 days off to to go to london with a couple of my friends and i messaged them about something in the middle of it and they fucking screamed at me they're like <laughs> what like we're, we're, I feel like we're getting we're getting a little deep into into like our own individual systems and, and we've been really, really fortunate to kind of like need those systems and stuff. So actually kind of like bouncing off this, I'd be really curious to know a little bit about your uh, your writing systems, especially starting off like before it became kind of the thing of like and Travis, you're you're a little bit you're a little bit different, I think, because you you had the 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 incredibly successful like like uh, narration career uh, before this, and then you decided to uh, to write a New York Times bestselling Hugo Award uh, winning book at the same time. <laughs> so, so you are a little bit different, but like I still would be curious to know, like, like let's let's say let's say that 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 you know we're a new author is coming to you and being like, you know, how did you get started, like, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what was your what was y'all system? Like, what was the 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 method by which you guys sat down and started producing the products that have kind of like built you up to where you are today because because i mine was pretty boring so i'm always curious to know how like everyone else's was like what do you mean what do you mean boring i'm not what do you, what it was mean? it was i had a day job i went home i wrote a thousand words that's it like that and like i it was like locked in i had to do that um but like that's there is there is nothing that's more a very legitimate system i was gonna say that's like uh, that's yeah that that works yeah, I, I I can't complain. I'm okay with it. Got me, <laughs> yeah. got me there. So, I mean, I, look, I'm interested to hear Travis uh, answer this because before being a wildly successful voice actor, he was a wildly successful game developer. So there's just a lot of, there's a trail of that. Yeah, you following didn't know Travis this? around. Dude, so, yeah. You were an were you an EP uh, for, for Torchlight Travis? What was your... I was the, I ran the company. I was the, the lead developer and the project manager. So I... I ran Runic Games for I don't know how many years, um, and then left to do Double Damage. Before that, I made that I was probably best known for Fate, which was a. A lot of people tell me they played it on their parents' laptops. Daniel um, is really glad right now that the camera is only from here up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm amazed. Sorry, go ahead. So we're talking about writing process, though. We're talking about writing system. I'm lost now. Yes, that's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I believe that. Like, okay. What was your what was your, All right. what was your system like? So my system didn't work for most of my life. I I uh, I really wanted to be a discovery writer, and I thought that was what worked for me, and so that's what I tried to do for all eternity, and it never worked. I would have a good idea, and I would get you know whatever percentage into the book, and I would tap out, and I could finish a novella because it was just just in reach, mm -hmm. and I could do shorts easy, but I just could not pull off a novel. Um, and, um, there, uh, so a couple things happened. One, um, when I finally wrote Legends and Lattes, it was the first time I outlined and I'm not saying that you should outline. I'm just saying, if you've been doing the same thing in your entire life and it doesn't work, you might as well try the other thing. Cause what do you have to lose? Um, but the other thing I think was, you, uh, you were talking about inspiration and people like overvaluing inspiration. I think that is definitely true because I think most ideas are actually pretty dumb if you reduce them. It's all about execution of an idea. So if you don't, if you don't fool yourself into believing that you have to have the biggest, best idea and the most amazing plot and all of the coolest scenes predetermined. Instead, if you can just have a core idea that you can work with, that you care about at all, that you can hold in your brain, even a simple idea can have merit. Because obviously, Legends of Lattes is a stupid idea. An orc opens a coffee shop. It just sounds dumb. But 
you can execute that any number of different ways, right? You could have made it really broadly humorous. You could have made it like orc bucks. You could have done anything with it, but instead it's basically earnest and it's relatable for people who have had a job for a long time and don't know if they want to do it anymore, which is a specific angle to take on what's effectively a stupid idea. So you can have a small idea and that's okay. And if you can hold a story in your head as your first story for a novel, it makes it so much easier to execute on it because you don't get lost trying to find all of these connections in the middle. You don't get lost trying to make it the great American novel. It has to be this incredible epic with eight POVs. You don't have to bite off more than you can chew. Um, so for me, that was revelatory and is the only reason the book got done. Um, and then I think the other component is just taking out of all of the things that get in your way, recognizing things that keep you from writing. Like, if I write someplace where it's noisy or there's snacks, I don't write. So I can't do that. I write in this box. That's what works for me. Bah. So I remove things that don't work. Um, I have to write at a specific time of day, and I can't stop writing. For me, a story is like a bar of soap, and if I let it get away from me, then I can't pick it back up again. So I have to write a chapter a day until it's done. That just happens to be what I have to do. You might not be that way, but identifying the things that break your ability to write and then saying, what can I do to remove this obstacle? It will go a long way to getting you on the right track, I think. So that's what don't drop the soap means. I'd heard it all these years and I never knew. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of yeah. versions of don't drop the soap. Yeah, but, don't, uh, I'm, I'm more right. concerned there's different that implications. Travis, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm more concerned that Travis doesn't actually have a house and he's just like in a field like Mr. Beast, <laughs> like, like yeah. he's just in a field with his narration box and there's an outhouse <laughs> over there, that's it. He's going to open the door and there's just like mountains in the background. It's a little big there's a wind. Yeah. I wish that was my view. I wish that was my view. <laughs> That's true. That'd be amazing. Yeah. So I, uh, so I have a, I guess a similar system when I was, uh, one, one of the things we say a lot around here, we, we just tend to say a lot is purpose, target group strategy. So we run everything through that and we go, why am I doing this? Uh, who am I doing it for? And then how do I reach the person I'm trying to reach for the purpose for that purpose? So when I'm writing a book and when I'm, when I, even when I started, I was going, okay, what I think is, I think there are other people who are like me that enjoy fantasy novels, but would enjoy them more if there were certain elements boiled out and you had a very action focused, streamlined fantasy story. So that was where I started with my first book. And so that was my hypothesis, right? I was like, I was going to try and prove this. So that was my target group. I wanted to see if there was anybody out there who wanted this very specific kind of action focused fantasy. And then my strategy to reach them was, okay, I'm going to write a book that's not any longer than it needs to be. It, we're going to take the kind of traditional formula and we're going to just take do a slight twist on it. So the, the kind of tagline for my initial book was, this guy is the chosen one's regular dude friend. And now he's trying to learn how to acquire the powers to keep up, to save the world before his friend does, right? So that was sort of the, the pitch for, for the, my first book. So I was trying to take the kind of expected formula, do just a very slight variation on it. I'm going to be honest, I didn't really do that too much. It's mostly, it's more a lot more about the original magic system than it is about that pitch I just gave you. But that was my idea, was I was trying to do that for something that, this, I thought this would be something that appealed to the kind of person I was looking for. And then my other part of the strategy was, for me, I would rather have a, a good book that comes out consistently rather than a great book when I don't know when the next one's coming out. So I went, two books a year was the thing I thought I could hit and the rate I thought I as a reader would like to get the book. And of course that limits how long it's gonna be also, right? Like that's, you know, you can only write a certain amount in that amount of time. So that was how I initially, even before I, while I was working on my first book, that was what I initially thought the, the strategy was. And the strategy was for how to get books that I thought my target audience would really love. The books that I thought that I as a reader would really want. I would want this and I would really like it if I thought the next book was coming out in a few months, right? So that was what I was setting out to do. And that it turns out there were people who were looking for that, I found out. And I sort of just kind of kept pedaling the bicycle, right? It was always a, uh, for me, I would want the next book to come out and to keep coming out. And I would want consistent releases. And so that's what I kept trying to do. And over that amount of time, Amazon and Kindle have changed their system a lot. And they really have gone through a lot of iterations, probably another one since we've started this interview. And every time they make a change, it seems to be to optimize 
this high sort of book release turnover, which, you know, some people are releasing six books a year and more power to them. Holy crap. Uh, but two, two has worked for me and that seems to be the, the sweet spot. So I average about two books a year. You know, I was, I was really afraid of that. I was, uh, I was personally really afraid of that system because I agree with you. I think that, that Amazon is being optimized for, for exactly that because I, I publish not because I want to, but just because it's how, how I work. I, I publish to, to kind of your nightmare scenario where I publish like <laughs> whenever the book is done and. My book two took three fucking years because I am incompetent, um, and yeah. and I was really surprised that uh, that that the book two did uh, did as well as it did because I agree with you. I really do think that that my system is not uh, is not ideal, and my system is not the one to to be modeled uh, after. Well, um, you know what? Let me, let me jump in jealous. on that real quick. Let me talk about your system real quick. So what you did in between in those three years was you kept releasing stuff that you kept content going, you kept, you stayed active. So the people who were following you were getting activity from you. They were seeing stuff. You were, I mean, you were the busiest man alive. So that you were anything but quiet over those three years. So it's not like you ghosted people from three years. You kept the momentum going. So if I was somebody who was following you and was interested in the work you were doing, I would be uh, still very engaged and very interested in what you were doing. So that's why I think that's why I think the, the three-year gap worked for you and works for you. Well, and the scale of your books is part of the equation and your readers recognize it. If you had released, you know, a 120-page pamphlet after three years, they might have been salty about it, but you don't. You released <laughs> eight books in one book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so all of your work was, was clearly there for them to see. They just got to get it all at once. Maybe. Yeah, I remember uh, the post on Progression Fantasy where they were like, look, I don't want to get downvoted for this, but I think Iron Prince was way better than Unsold. And the top comment was, Iron Prince was the length of like the first four books in Cradle. <laughs> and I was like, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and it was it's di different. It's different. It's different systems. It was just it was just interesting to me. I, I still appreciate it. I think I'm going to frame... I think I'm going to frame the picture of you being like, I think this could be like a cradle release. And I was like, no fucking way, bro. <laughs> and then it hit number oh, three. Yeah. And, I, and all I get from, all I get from Will is, I, did you send me like a gif? It was like, I did. I so. sent you and I told you so. <laughs> I, yeah. was like, yeah. I was like, I mean, I appreciate this, but fuck you. <laughs> I also was the, I was the person, I texted Bryce uh, just, you know, a few weeks ago when the second book came out. I, uh, I I was like, hey man, congrats on number three in the Kindle store. He went, what? I'm not walking my dog. What happened? And so I was yeah. able to get a, a screenshot of number three and because and it, it's been and this is this is a this is a totally quick thing, but like this is just for 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 published authors. It has been updating like clockwork at like 7:50 a.m. for me. Like every day I check, huh. and that is when the update comes out, and that's when I'm walking my dog. So you texted me, and I was like, qua. So. <laughs> but one of the uh, things when you talk about anyways. systems. That is like apparent, I think, a lot of when you look at a lot of successful authors, and it's something that I wasn't really thinking about coming over from games, but is also a big deal in games is the idea of audience overlap in your book. That you're really not targeting just one audience, you're probably targeting three. And that just hugely widens the funnel. And there's, I think, an art to doing that and to finding these, these wedges of audience that overlap without a lot of friction. And the fact that there's going to be people who are part of all three audiences too. And, uh, I mean, so legends of lattes is like, well, it's cozy fantasy, but also it has all this baking stuff. And also it's got this element of like fixing up buildings. There's, I like, you know, I can, I can even think of these yeah. as shows. So there's like fixer upper. I really like fixer upper. You know who else, what else I like? I like the great British bake off. People who like fixer upper tend to like the great British bake off. Um, but they're different things um and then you layer fantasy on top of that but the fantasy is fantasy isn't really off-putting so if you're not a fantasy person you can yeah. still get into it and it's and if all you really want is the baking and the repairing of a crappy old building you're still fine there's a way of like removing the friction between those overlapping audiences to allow them to work together which just means that more people can read your book yeah i've definitely found that one of the things that so people are always asking me what do you recommend I read now that I've finished Cradle? And I'm going, that depends entirely on what you liked about Cradle. So there's a lot of things, there's a lot of elements and aspects you might have liked or not liked about Cradle that then that, because I don't know you, it's hard for me to just sort of randomly recommend to somebody on Reddit 
uh, what book to read. But Daniel, I had a question for you. We were talking about systems and release rates, and it's been my observation that uh, nothing optimizes regular releases more than YouTube does. So how do you? How do you feel? So you've done, you've written novels, and you've released on YouTube. What are your thoughts about releasing content regularly? So. If you're trying to get started, if you're speaking specifically on YouTube, uh, you need to be at least semi-regular unless you're one of the big boys. If you need to have some kind of sustained presence to keep yourself one in people's mind uh, and interesting to YouTube. Uh, granted, I've talked to a lot of people who are more behind the scenes uh, at YouTube now, and when they uh, say like, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to play the algorithm, those people at YouTube say, well, what you're trying to do is get people's attention. The algorithm's not as yep. swaying as it used to be apparently allegedly i'll put the legal disclaimer here <laughs> allegedly um so i try to do the opposite when it comes to my books youtubers there's two types there's people who do massive projects and they drop it and they hope it finds an audience picks up and carries on to sustain them while they work on their next huge project or you're like me and you read a book every week or something and you talk about it that week and you kind of just cycle through if i got as many views as i do on a huge project and let me put out one video a month i wouldn't make a livable like channel i have to have a higher output um hmm. so i've tried to ignore that entirely when it comes to writing and i always just view writing as like i'm gonna write this idea i have i have all kinds of things floating around my head because i'm a big old fantasy nerd and i'm 100 percent gonna just do the best i can i have no formal training i'll get an editor the best i can and i'll put it out for my audience to judge uh and so far it's gone okay <laughs> which is how i'll put it yeah um, and I, I always try to improve and do better. I think one thing that every author, every writer of any sort can agree on is you always look back at your last book and say, okay, now what can I improve? Because um, yeah. you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get feedback, uh, willingly or not, you're going to hear all kinds of things. And so it's about oh, yeah. hearing that do better, which I also, that is something I did carry over from YouTube. For the first th three years I had the channel, every video I tried to learn one new thing to do in that video, whether it was editing or you know something to always improve it. Uh, now for books, you can't have that rapid a turnaround, but I then, I, one of the first things I did after my first book came out was I watched a ton of reviews, which hurt a lot, and <laughs> I wrote down their biggest complaints, yeah. and then I just tried to get better at those specific things. Um, and that was the whole learning process for me, because I don't have a classroom, uh, so I tried to make my own. Mm. But I did have a great question for us to come to an end here, if you don't mind, for you all. And this one, I'm twisting one we got from the audience here that I think uh, is kind of, you're the perfect people to answer this. Because we have uh, Mr. Baldry here who landed, I think you even just said, like the perfect time for your book. You knew what the people wanted. You put something out that was truly from the heart and resonated. Will, you just spoke at length. Sorry, Mr. White. I don't know why I went Baldry and then, I, I don't respect you apparently. You call me Will, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. You said, you know, you, you really worked at trying to make something you wanted and you found your audience that way. And Bryce, your every day is trying to find authors and write things that are gonna be, you know, connecting to a market right now. What are your predictions? What are things you feel audiences will want either now or in the coming years? Is there any instincts tickling in the head or is it kind of, hey, I had my thing, not really sure from here. And Bryce, I'll put this at you first because uh, I feel like you and I talk about this a lot. <laughs> This is going to be this is going to be a, a bit of a a bit of a, a sidestep answer because honestly I'm not smart enough to come up with a really like thought out answer really quickly. But um, the uh, the the way to the way to kind of hit the space consistently, and when I say consistently, I mean to 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 maximize your potential your potential success in any kind of space that you are going into and will actually touched on this a little bit and i'm glad we're kind of going back to this it's not it's not a prediction of like how i think things are going to go because i really don't know like dragon ball z is going to survive forever or it's going to disappear tomorrow and progression fantasy is going to disappear but um what i have personally found that i really think resonates with a lot of people is when you can find something that people enjoy and people love and you can twist it just a little bit to make it to make it your own and will will said exactly this and i have no idea why my camera just uh that was just totally so well timed with your hand there. gesture it's, it's, like, it's, very, it's, it's very dramatic <laughs> yeah maybe 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 it's literally just my does my camera have hand gestures no um <laughs> but uh 
But um, okay, my camera is just totally, totally out of whack now. Does it go? I'm gonna go way back. No, it doesn't. It's a nostalgia um, filter. Anyways, mm-hmm. it's a nostalgia filter. I just come up way yeah, close. It's a nostalgia. All right, filter. we're dealing with this now. Um, when you can, if you can, if you can, instead of trying to predict the market, like personally, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna throw this in your face and, and say fuck you for asking about pr- about predicting <laughs> the the future, Daniel. And I'm gonna say instead of trying to predict the market, if you want to find the things that you enjoy and find the things that 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 you deem that there are people who are going to look for them and and people want them so so what we was talking about and then you can twist them just enough so that they stay comfortable and stay something that people people know and people feel feel good about but but make it your own and legends and lattes is a perfect fucking example of this but make it your own in a way that 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 people look at it and they're like i love this this feels so good this feels so comfortable and yet it feels so new that's how that's the only prediction that i'm going to give you is 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 a consistent hitter is is if you can find a a, a niche of like like if you want to go totally different if you want to go totally original that's amazing you should do that that's what you should choose but if you're looking for something within the market that that is kind of my my only constant recommendation is find Find the thing that you love, that other people love, and find a way to make it your own in a way that's still comfortable for other readers. Uh, Travis, you mentioned your work there, so I'm going to pass that to you next, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, I don't think that I have the ability to to predict anything. I certainly didn't with Legends and Lattes. I didn't think anybody else was going to like it. But maybe that maybe that leads to one observation, which is that I think, ultimately, when things break out, it's because they didn't exist in that form in a way that people could find at a quality level that made them comfortable to a large number of people. So it's very easy when you're trying to come up with an idea to say, I want this, but it must not be a good idea because it doesn't already exist. That we often look to what already exists as validation for whether our ideas are any good. If this was a good idea, it would already be out there, right? Except Apparently it's not, right? That specific, and it doesn't have to be like world changing. It could be just two concepts that everybody's very comfortable and familiar with that just haven't been assembled in this way before, that haven't made this particular flavor. And if you have a strong feeling about something like that, if it is something that you want and you can set aside whether you think anybody else wants it just because you don't already see an example of it out in the world, then maybe there's something there for you to make that other people are also looking for and also discounting but it, because it doesn't currently exist in the world so they both wonderfully sidestepped the question will you are welcome to do so as well <laughs> yeah all right perfect <laughs> I, Bob, I got one real all right so first thing first thing i would say is i think people like compelling stories period so i think there's always a market no matter what concept you're using for a for a compelling story but i would also say rather than predicting i would go uh, I've been I've been looking for genres that I think are popular but underserved, which is kind of like so. The reason I'm writing so what I call space fantasy right now is uh, so it's basically it's like it's it's just soft sci-fi. It's it's the sci-fi tropes, but the main character is a wizard, right? So that's what I'm writing right now, and um, the reason I'm doing that is because. I like reading Star Wars. I like reading all these different space fantasy stuff. I like playing Metroid as a kid. And I don't see a lot. There's not a lot of that coming out. There's some, but not a lot. And so I was going, okay, so let me do that. And there's the two things I think of that are underserved that I want are space fantasy and, honestly, the general vanilla standard fantasy. I read a lot of Japanese and Korean light novels. And one of the things they play on a lot is the hero beats the demon king thing. And I don't think I've ever read a story where the hero just goes out, gathers companions, and actually just goes and beats the Demon King. I don't know that I've ever actually read that. It's always a twist on it. So I'm like, I kind of just want to read, like, the normal thing. Like, just the normal, that's a compelling story. So, anyway, that's my answer. Fair enough. Uh, I, it's funny, I was funny. I just finished Blue-Eyed Samurai, which falls like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, I was like, yeah. and all these twists and turns. And yeah, you could say on like, the broader structure, it's what they're setting out. And the, you could always... I don't like when people over reduce stories down and say like everything falls into the hero's journey when they'll point to an yeah. example that you can make the case. No, it doesn't. Um, like people right. say, oh, at the end of Lord of the Rings, Frodo's back in his like Frodo comfy place. 
No, he's not. I'll make the debate <laughs> nope. all day that he's yeah. not. Um, but thank you, everyone, so much for being willing to sit down and have this chat. I was very nervous beforehand, and I feel like it went wonderful. So I appreciate you all. Yeah, thanks for having us, Daniel. Thank you. Say it right, Daniel. God. Wonderfully. <laughs> Damn it, Bryce. <laughs> and, you, and you claim to be a fucking writer. Now, hey, you want to talk about biggest hurdles? <laughs> Dyslexia for me. So I'm just going to hide behind that, and just it's my shield for every criticism. <laughs> I'm really disappointed we we didn't get to talk about writing with ADHD. That's something I wanted to talk to you about at some point. But I was uh, about to ask about that because I was sitting here like you brought it up earlier, but we hit the hour. I know you guys got schedules. I don't want to push it, uh, but I just want to say I appreciate you all. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Will, so much. And Bryce, it's always nice to have you on the channel. It's so good to see all of you. Yeah, thanks again, Daniel course yeah, and we'll we soon. will say goodbye audience Bryce the only reason I phrased it differently is because you've been on the channel before all right let's <laughs> all right goodbye audience and thank you so much uh, I now am going to be bringing uh, our new giant shark friend on the, the stream this is how it's over because we're in the water and uh, if the sharks in the water you know it's time to go